I wanted to make sure that I spent as much energy and time focusing on getting things done, completed, uh, before the next seven months are up. Tonight, AFN Chief Perry Bellegarde says he won't be seeking re-election this July. We're the ripple effect, so to say. Um, so we're, we're going to go to those places and get drunk, get high, uh, do, do what everybody's doing just to cope, right? We look at the child welfare system on the streets of Kenora, Ontario. The Fire Rate Fellowship is unique in that it's not only a national program, but it's led by Indigenous people. And a new program to help women and non-binary people start and run a business. Good evening, welcome to APTN National News. I'm Melissa Ridgen. He's been the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nation for six years, but this morning on social media, Perry Bellegarde announced he's not running for re-election. The announcement came ahead of this week's virtual meeting of the AFN, and seven months before the next election, we're joined now by National Chief Perry Bellegarde. Well, thanks for joining us. Your announcement is on the eve of the virtual Chief's Assembly. Why now to announce the decision? Well, when you think about it uh, in terms of timing, uh, we've got about six months, six to seven months left uh, before my term ends in July uh, of 2021. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to make sure that I spent as much energy and time focusing on getting things done, completed, uh, before the next seven months are up. And, and things like uh, Bill C-15, mm -hmm. the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, it's a very important bill. Um, things like uh, the policing, uh, seen as an essential service legislation, which we still have to work on and get in place, influencing the federal budget. There's just so many things that we need to get done. And I didn't want to be distracted uh, by having to run a campaign. Um, you know, I'll have seven years in as AFN National Chief, and uh, we moved the yard sticks down the field, no question. Um, but I didn't want to be distracted with running a campaign because that's un that's a full-time job unto itself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how satisfied are you that you've accomplished what you set out to do? For example, closing the gap was a frequent uh, desire. How much of that gap has been closed? Well, when you think about it, uh, and I was asked a question early on, some of the things we could look at and say the yardsticks have moved. Mm -hmm. um, you think of the last six federal budgets, like when you tally up all the billions that have been set aside for First Nations people, it's $27 billion. Wow. That's five colonial accords and uh, so that's advocacy work that's lobbying that's influencing the federal budgeting cycle and those are key strategic investments in housing and water and infrastructure and broadband and, and education and health care mm -hmm. and uh, we need to keep doing more investments because the gap is still not completely closed but it's moving in the right direction yeah i think of bill c91 the languages act that's a huge victory about revitalization of our languages C-92, child welfare, mm. where First Nations law is paramount, recognized as paramount, so we can start focusing on prevention, not apprehension, for our child welfare system, because there's 40,000 children in care. So I, I think uh, the yardstick has moved, but we still have some way to go yet. Yeah. Um, that government-sponsored under it bill may become law before you leave, but what else in there remains unfinished as you head into the last seven months? Well, we want to make sure there's adequate investments in the uh, in the federal budgeting process in the, the next federal budgeting cycle. Uh, we want to make sure that we're not forgotten with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, mm -hmm. with the immunization and making sure there's proper PPE and adequate health care uh, services and needs that, that should be met in the north and the south for our people. Um, there's lots of work yet to do uh, regarding uh, policing as essential service. Uh, we got to make sure that that uh, the 1.5 billion that Minister Mark Miller talks about for closing the water gap is is, is adequately put in place. Mm -hmm. It's a fundamental human right. So there's there's ongoing work, no question. Um, so we've just got to be vigilant and, and maintain the pressure on the crown because these are federal crown, federal fiduciary trust obligations, and we've got to hold them uh, to make sure that we see results going forward. What do you hope will be a priority for your successor? Well, I'd hope the, the successor um, maintains the momentum mm -hmm. that we built up and continues to build bridges and allies, not only with First Nations people, but people right across Canada. And, uh, you know, we've done an annals poll that showed that 67% of Canadians want to see the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples implemented. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have, we have a lot of support. So continue to build on those key allies and key bridges with people across Canada. Because once you deal with First Nations issues, which are really Canada's issues, 
um, you help not only First Nations people, well, thanks for taking the time to share that with us. We've got lots of time to talk to you before you wrap up and move on from AFN. Thanks so much, Perry. We want to hear what you think about Perry Bellegarde's decision to not seek re-election at the AFN, and also who should be his successor. You can share your thoughts with us. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca. You can leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and now TikTok. You can follow APTN News and join the conversation and see all of our latest stories there. To Mi'kma'ki now, where moderate livelihood fishery negotiations continue, Shebaganagany First Nation Chief Mike Sachs says the Department of Fishery and Oceans is using a colonial approach and is calling on the Prime Minister to intervene. Angel Moore brings us this update. Hello, Winnipeg. Sabag and Nagati First Nation moderate livelihood fishery negotiations have taken a turn in response to the draft agreement from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Chief Mike Sack said it is using a colonial approach leading to disconnect and not ensuring reconciliation. A complete waste of months of talk and we, we said very early on that we want to have a upfront and open conversation and um, to see if there even was a point of discussing and, and they knew we weren't going to go for you know them telling us when to fish and how many of our people can fish and uh, just the limits that they try to put on it. As a result, SAC is calling on the Prime Minister to ensure a self-government agreement for the Sabaga Negri Treaty Fishery Management Plan, which was launched last September. It was met with violence from non-Indigenous fishers who say the fishery is illegal. Now it's more than fishing for us, it's about uh, just that respect that should be there and um, for Canada to uphold the treaties. Meanwhile, in St. Mary's Bay, high winds have stalled the commercial fishery, which was to start last week, and Sabag and Nagati lobster harvesters are running out of time. The moderate livelihood fishery will end next week as the lobsters move to deeper waters. The band does not have larger boats to fish in deep water. Back to you, Winnipeg. Thanks for that, Angel. The federal government tabled a new UNDRIP bill in the House of Commons last week. It follows the efforts of former NDP MP Romeo Saganash's private member's bill, which failed to get through the Senate and become law. Tabling Bill C-15 is a liberal promise from the last election, but the former Saganash bill, like that one, it also has its skeptics. Jamie Pashagumsgum spoke with some of them. Justice Minister David Lametti announced the new legislation on Thursday saying that Indigenous groups, including the Assembly of First Nations, were all consulted in its development. Alma Brooks is with the Native Women's Association of Canada. She calls that statement deceitful. And in fact, people weren't consulted properly. We are the rights holders. We are the rights holders. The people are the rights holders, not AFN. AFN is a government-funded lobby group. That's all. And I don't care how many times they change their charter. They do not speak for us. At the presentation Thursday, the only issue National Chief Perry Bellegarde had was that it would take three years for Lametti and his team to develop a national action plan. Bellegarde wants it sooner. Mary Ellen Turpel Lafont is a law professor at UBC. She agrees with the National Chief. I just don't want to see delays and divisions, um, and I'm worried about that. So, you know, it will be really important to see who's going to be in charge of this project, how quickly. Like, I would like to see them engaging already on things like racism and violence. Also present Thursday was Romeo Saganash, the architect of C-15's predecessor, C-262. It died in the Senate due to the obstruction of Conservative senators. As with C-262, the federal Conservatives have a problem with consultation and pre- and prior informed consent. I don't think anyone wants um, a new piece of legislation to end up putting us in the courts more often than not and actually hampering the reconciliation journey. So I think clarity um, is absolutely important so that people understand what it is, what it isn't, and, and we don't see that clarity in this document. Turpel Lafon doesn't share conservative concerns. I think there's like so much misunderstanding. It's almost like people peddle this misunderstanding that somehow FPIC, free prior informed consent, is some sort of veto to shut down the economy. And that is just myth. Turpel Lafont says it could take five years from today before Canada finalizes their action plan. And that's if the bill passes this time around. Jamie Pashagumskum, APTN National News, 
Ottawa. 49 initiatives above the 49th parallel. That's how Quebec is branding its Northern Quebec plan for 2020 to 2023. It makes several promises to improve quality of life for First Nations and Inuit. They were announced at a press conference in Quebec City. The province will invest $1.4 billion over three years to improve livability. This includes expanding highways, improving internet access, and establishing telehealth services. More than $40 million will go to conservation and clean water initiatives. Cote Nord Minister Jonathan Julian says it's about planning for the people. Our territory, Nordic, you know, is very vast and unique. Et il recèle de nombreuses ressources, des ressources naturelles, oui, mais aussi est riche en culture euh, portée par, par ses habitants. Ce sont ces gens qui bénéficieront concrètement de notre plan. A First Nations community in BC has just completed a project that will harness the sun to offset costs. The Slaver-Tooth Nation in North Vancouver just completed solar-powered installation that will completely power their newly built administration building. They have already a solar panel that powers their community daycare centre. This is about 341 solar panels uh, that uh, will be the largest solar array project in all of the North Shore. It, it sort of makes it a little bit of a full circle now with our cultural values of uh, being stewards of the land um, in a modern way and to really provide a strong message. Us as Indigenous peoples really need to be taking our ancestral wisdom to convert that into modern ways of renewable energy and sustainability. Time for us to take a break, but still ahead, we take a trip to northwestern Ontario to a city to see how the child welfare system is playing out on the streets there. A lot of these, these youths who are, you know, just turning 18, they're no longer part of the system. They end up just, you know, carrying on. Welcome back. We kick off our second week of APTN's special look at the child welfare system. This time we're in Kenora, Ontario. APTN producer Kenneth Jackson toured the northwestern Ontario city back in September to see how the child welfare system plays out on the streets there. Take a look. There's always a few sitting at this spot. You walk by them every day. Maybe try not to look them in the eyes. And there's more by the beer store. It's early in the morning and they're waiting for it to open. There's a child in each of them. Can you see it? One destroyed by the child welfare system that plays out on the streets of Kenora every day. And no one knows that more than this guy. We're the ripple effect, so to say. Um, so we're, we're going to go to those places and get drunk, get high, uh, do, do what everybody's doing just to cope, right? Levan speaks from experience. Yeah, he used to live on these streets. Um, Jory Smith still does. Like, Both took APTN around Kenora in September to show us how the child welfare system feeds the streets. I see uh, a, a, na like, a nation that's suffering and, and, and I, see, uh, I see it just being ignored pretty much. Like there's a there's a vicious cycle. A lot of these these youths who are you know just turning 18, they're no longer part of the system. They end up just you know carrying on. As Smith speaks, a group of young guys walk by. He knows them from jail and foster care, especially the guy in black and yellow. That one guy had, was sponsored by like DC, um, Crown Royal. He was a pro snowboarder and. You know, one of those guys right there? Yeah, the guy in the yellow. He's a pro snowboarder? Pro snowboarder. And, you saw and that phone and walking he's, away? He's a, he's a alcoholic now. You know, and we keep on our walk around Kenora. Signs of child welfare are everywhere. I asked him about the local jail. This is going to be a perfect, uh, a perfect example. The jail is about 95% Aboriginal, but the staff is only 2% Aboriginal. So that kind of just paints a picture of the town, right? It's like an old boys club. As we keep going, it's become clear racism is also at play here. So much so 
the city council talked about passing an any loitering by law. And if you haven't guessed by now, most of the homeless people are First Nations. I wouldn't just say, say so much it was the mayor that called for that. I would say it's the people in this town. And that's, you know, that's where the racism still stays, is, is the actual people in this town that believe so much into creating, oh, it's such a nice city, it's such a nice town. So we keep going on our walk of Pretty Kenora. We stop near a farmer's market. Smith then explains how policing in this city changed a few years ago. The difference I noticed between the Kenora police and OPP is the Kenora police might like rough, rough you up real good but you might leave without getting charged. The OPP does everything according to plan, but then, you know, there's ridiculous charges. And then we hear some of that Kenora charm, as Smith explains how homeless people keep getting charged with minor offenses. There's people that have been in the system for almost 10 years now because they keep getting that breach because they, they don't, you yeah, um, they don't know any better than to just continue on with life, right? And, that was um, that was uh, an, someone who is probably ignorant. Soon we meet another person. She knows the streets well. She also knows addiction. My name is Miranda Elder. Um, I'm from Kenora. I left um, for a while to Thunder Bay and Sault Ste. Marie, but I've lived here most of my life. And it's an, I have a different perspective on things because I went to school for social work and then became an IV drug user. That means she knows who lives on the streets. How do you see child welfare play out on the streets of Kenora? I just see the same thing happening over and over again. I see um, families, like people are being placed with families that are worse by far than their actual family. She estimates at least three quarters of people on the street come from the child welfare system. We are near the end of our walk when we run into a group of people. I can spot the self-harming on the arm of the young girl in the middle. She's quiet and doesn't want to say much. So her friend does the talking. It's not fair, man. It's hard to find a place to live, right? So no, it's not fair. If you survive a child welfare system, you may end up here in Kenora with no place to go except the streets or jail. We need to take another commercial break, but when we come back, a new program for Indigenous women and non-binary people. Fiery Fellowship is unique in that it's not only a national program, but it's led by Indigenous peoples. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. Santa's little helpers are starting to appear. This is five-month-old Jamie Jr. of Puckatawaga, Manitoba. Thanks to Joanne Caribou for sharing that. Brighten everybody's day a little bit. You can send your festive decorations or your winter landscapes or other adorable pictures like that to share at aptn.ca. Your photo could be our next photo of the day. Well, let's now take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Over to the east coast, we've got nine in rain for St. John's, two in snow for Halifax. Cartwright, minus 2 and snow, uh, mostly sunny for name, minus 4 degrees there. Sunny Hill, sunny, and minus 2, Quebec City, minus 2, mix of sun and cloud. London, 2 degrees and sunshine, minus 5 and sunny up in North Bay. Cap is casing 0 and snow, 2 and snow for Big Trout Lake. Churchill, minus 8 and snow, 2 and sunshine for Norway House. 4 and sunny for Winnipeg, 8 and sunshine for Dauphin. Lots of sun in Saskatchewan, too. Threes for Saskatoon and North Battleford. Three in Buffalo, Narrows and Sunshine. Mix of sun and cloud in Stony Rapids and zero. Minus two in Sunny for high level. Uh, three in a mix of sun and cloud for Fort McMurray. Four in a mix of sun and cloud for Edmonton. Fourteen, lots of sunshine down in Lethbridge. Nine in Sunny in Kamloops. Seven and rain for Bella Coola. Prince Rupert, five and showers. Minus one in Sunshine for Deese Lake. Minus 5 and sunny for Mayo, minus 15, mix of sun and cloud for Dawson City. Norman Wells, minus 16 and sunshine, minus 13 for a yellow knife and sunny there. Inuvik and Tuktuk -tuk -tuk snow at minus 19 degrees. Whale Cove and Chesterfield, minus 9 and uh, snow, same with New Yacht. Kenai, minus 5 and snow, minus 5 also for Calouite, uh, but a mix of sun and cloud, minus 16 and mix of sun and cloud for Clyde River.
There's a new national online business accelerator program for indigenous women and non-binary people. The Fireweed Fellowship's goal is to help businesses grow and to do it with an indigenous environment. APTN's Chris Stewart has that story. Indigenous-owned businesses are still underrepresented across Canada, and the Fireweed Fellowship wants to help change that. Larissa Crawford is taking a unique course that has just started up. The Fiery Fellowship is unique in that it's not only a national program, but it's led by Indigenous peoples. And it's created space for Indigenous peoples where we can honor our indigeneity, our culture, our languages, our ancestors, earth, and our relationships to all of that as we explore what doing business can look like for us. The fellowship is running a 10-month online course for Indigenous women and non-binary entrepreneurs who want to grow their business. They say it's the first accelerator program for Indigenous women and non-binary people in the world. Jacqueline Jennings is the director of the Fireweed Fellowship. So they're testing a prototype or they're in the market generating revenue and we support them in growing and scaling their business with um, wraparound support such as professional coaching, mentorship, um, financial literacy, investment readiness. With fundraising from the Raven Indigenous Partners, they are able to provide this training for free. 24 applicants were selected for the first year of the program, which began in early November with a wide range of ages. There's a definitely an intergenerational um, variety. And so our youngest participant is 23. And we have a, we have a, a handful of participants in their um, mid-20s. Um, and then I would say on the upper end, um, we're honored to have participants in their, um, in their fit, well into their 50s. So we have a, we have a really um, dynamic uh, group. Larissa Crawford is part of that group. She wants a better understanding of how to properly expand her business. I want to understand what our finance people are doing. I want to understand how to set up our business so that it is investment ready. Um, and that's very much what the fellowship is seeking to do. Um, and I'm really looking forward um, to building that part of myself that I've just not been comfortable with. The fellowship says they have plans to have a second year in 2021. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. Well, that is your news to kick off the week. Don't forget that all APTN news programming, including Face to Face, In Focus, Nation to Nation, and APTN Investigates will be bringing you extensive child welfare coverage this week as part of the two-week perspective series that we introduced you to last week. Make sure you tune in to that. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Thanks for joining me. Having a great night.